Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Los Angeles Women's Theater Festival 10th Annual Empowerment Weekend. My name is Sky Palkowitz, and for those of you who don't know me, I go by she, her, uh, and I'm a Caucasian woman on the outside with wild blue hair and funky makeup and always colorful and bright clothing and a big smile, and I'm multicultural on the inside. And uh, today <laughs> we're going to be talking with our co-founder and president of the Los Angeles Women's Theater Festival, Adila Barnes, and uh, Adila's gigantic journey and career as not only a solo theater artist and director and coach and teacher and educator, but also as a film and TV star and you know somebody who's just run the gamut of the arts throughout her life. And I'm really excited to once again, interview you, Adila, and talk about your journey and to offer our participants so much encouragement and empowerment and inspiration. Um, so just real briefly, you know, I came upon meeting you in the year 2000 when I was just about coming to Los Angeles as a young budding solo theater artist myself. Uh, and I've done seven solo shows around the country, so I'm no stranger to the world of solo theater. I was introduced to Adila. Oh, hi, everybody. Boy, I could see people. Hi, Heather. Maybe everybody should um, just take off their camera for now. No, no video for now, but at the end, we're going to open it up and you guys can ask questions and everybody can say hi to each other. But for those of us who may not have makeup on or might be eating or drinking, let's just turn your cameras off. And it's just gonna be me and Adila right now. Um, hi, Jana. Hi, everybody. See, I see you. <laughs> Uh, so I met Adila and I was very inspired and I very quickly became involved with the Los Angeles Women's Theater Festival. First, um, as, a, as a submitter, I, I was interested in doing my solo shows. And then also um, I started working as a stage manager for some of the shows. You guys, Kat, everybody, you have to, hi, everybody, please turn off your microphones because there's interference and turn off your cameras as well until the very end. Thank you. Um, okay, so, and I met Adila and I was completely inspired and I became involved with the festival and found out that there's this community here in Los Angeles that she helped to create and has been, you know, spearheading ever since. Uh, we're in our 31st year, it's pretty impressive. And um, I, I've, I've been hooked on the festival ever since. I've been a board member for close to 15 years. I've been working with the festival for over 20. Adila, you're also a personal friend of mine and always a mentor. You performed at my wedding. I mean, it, you know, it goes really deep. So I, I know you, but I still have a lot of questions. So I'm very excited to interview you and find out about your journey. And uh, for those of you who are new to the Los Angeles Women's Theater Festival, just a little background. It was founded in 1993 by Ms. Adila Barnes and Miriam Reed. And it holds the distinction of being the oldest annual solo festival in Los Angeles, celebrating powerful women performers. Uh, we're critically acclaimed. We've produced close to 700 extraordinary solo performers from all around the world. And we've also honored many, many, I, I was counting, if we've done 30 years and we honor five people a year, that's 150 women that have made extraordinary contributions in the world of theater and entertainment and education. And we've honored them and it's, it's an amazing festival. And if you're, again, if you're new to us, mark your calendars. We're accepting submissions right now until the end of the month. Uh, for our 31st annual festival, which we always hold during Women's Month, which is March. So this upcoming year in 2024, it's going to be March 21st through the 24th. It's a Thursday through a Sunday, almost a whole week of performances with a gala, champagne, award show on Thursday night, uh, diverse performances on Friday night, two on Saturday, two on Sunday. So if you have a solo show, check it out. Well, you're gonna be here with us this weekend, hopefully, and um, you can submit on our website, www.lawtf.org. Now let's talk about a dealer. Uh, but before we go there, I just also wanna make an acknowledgement, which we always do, uh, land acknowledgement. The Los Angeles Women's Theater Festival would like to acknowledge that the Tongva, 
Humish and Kiz people are the traditional caretakers of the land now recognized as Los Angeles County. And we celebrate the wisdom of this land and its indigenous caretakers. Uh, we are a multicultural and multidisciplinary performance troupe representing diverse disciplines from uh, theater, dance, the world of storytelling, performance art, avant-garde, performance poetry, spoken word, mime, music, comedy, cabaret, clowning, and more. So uh, it's, it's quite, quite a, a long array of diversity and performance from all around the world. Um, we also just want to quickly thank our government grantors and sponsors. That's the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture, California Arts Council, City of Culver City, an anonymous foundation, uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs, Los Angeles, City National Bank, California Wellness Foundation, Exhibit Partners, Black Bowed Giving Fund, KPFK 90.7 FM, Adila Barnes Productions, and many, many others. So now everybody, let's like lean back. I know um, the last couple of Facebook lives, I was like going very frenetically because we had so many people to talk to. And now it's just going to be an hour of hearing from Ms. Adila, the woman whose shoulders we all stand upon for this wonderful festival. And we're going to go back a little bit and talk about the beginning. So Adila, hi, welcome. And thank you for having me interview you here. Uh, always good to see you, and tomorrow we'll get to hug and see each other in person. So, yes, we will. Tell us a little bit about you, where you grew up, what you know your upbringing was like, and what was that aha moment that ignited you into the world and finding your passion for acting and theater? Actually, I grew up in a very small town, an agricultural community called Oroville, California. Oh. And translated, that would be Town of Gold. And in 1850, we were a gold rush town. So a lot of people came to Oroville to pan for gold. And so it was a small town on our side of town where African-Americans lived. It was really like a small community that had been airlifted from the South and dropped in California. So we had many, many people who had come from the South, were first generation South and, um, or California. And it was a community where our elders really wanted the best for us and where they all raised us. So I grew up really respecting my elders and I always loved learning from them, listening to their stories, and so that's how I began in a small town. My mother was really my first mentor. She actually built our own home. She had, I believe it was something like $300. I'll have to go back and look in my book, but I think it was something like $300. And she bought this lot of land. It was on a corner lot in our little town of Oroville. She didn't know how in the heck she was going to build a house, but she knew she had the land. So my uncle, Thado, who had built his own home, he headed the project. So we had men that would pass by on, you know, at 3330 Fallbrook Avenue in Oroville, and they would pass by in cars, on bicycles, walking. And they would ask my mother, do you need some help with that house? Because they would see my uncle and others that would be nailing their identity in the property. And my mother would always say, you know, I need some help. <laughs> <laughs> so men would stop and she didn't have any money to pay them. So she offered to them her incredible meals that were homemade. Mm -hmm. So some of the things that she would prepare were things like black eyed peas with okra, cornbread. We would have pies that were baked from scratch, like egg pies. A lot of people don't even know what an egg pie is, but I do, some of you may. And potato salad and potato pies and fried chicken. Some good old it's Southern comfort food, right? All <laughs> of those comfort foods. So men, as I say in my book, 
they would come, they would nail their identities in that house. They'd sit around and have their meals and lie about all the women they had. <laughs> so that's, that's really what my beginning was. So I came from a small town, humble background. I came from the have nots. And I began to act when I was 16. I was in a program called Project Upward Bound. It was at Chico State. And that was about 22 miles away from Oroville. And I was 16. It was the summer of my sophomore year in high school. And our director was directing The Ugly Duckling by A. A. Milne. And it was the most incredible way to start as an actor because he cast based on who he thought was best for the role. It had nothing to do with ethnicity. So I was African-American playing the queen, my first role, the queen. And my husband was Anglo with dark brown hair. Our daughter was a blonde with blue eyes. Her suitor was darker than me, African-American. And so that's how I began with non-traditional casting. So I always believed starting at 16, I could play any role that I wanted to, no limitations. And that's an incredible and a very empowering way to start as an actor. That's great. That was something I was, you know, prepping to ask you a little later, but, you know, the inspiration of just breaking boundaries and, you know, like you said, colorblind casting and just playing any role, having that mindset as a 16 year old thinking you can do anything. I'm sure that rippled out into your life as well, being able to be that empowered and confident. Um, so that was your first acting role. And so then what happened from there? You got the bug, that was it. It was the calling and on to it college. It felt really good having my mother sit there in the front row, clapping proudly and just the power of the role of playing the queen. So the next two summers, because Upward Bound is a three summer program, your third summer, you're prepping to go into college. I went to UC Santa Cruz. And so each summer I took drama classes. And so that was the first. And then the other two summers I was in another play. And so I always thought though as a child that I would be an English teacher. So I would always gather all the neighborhood kids together in the summertime, cut up little pieces of paper. I'd be the teacher, they'd be the students. And as I say in my book, it's kind of interesting to look back. Nobody ever challenged me and said, I want to be the teacher this time. You always get to be the teacher. It was just understood that I was the teacher and they were not. <laughs> well, they probably and recognized from a very early age there that you had those, you know, that kind of... Um, that kind of power, that kind of insight, they didn't want to mess with you. They're like, okay, let's learn from her. She's the teacher. Well, you know, I think the blessing has been the Aries me that I've been gifted to be a leader all my life. And so I began, you know, teaching the kids in the summer. Here I was not much older than them. And so I really thought I was going to major in theater. Well, actually, I thought I was going to major in English. And then after the three summers of being in Upward Bound and going to UC Santa Cruz and forming a Black theater company called Black Magic and being in productions on campus, I said, ah, it's not me being an English teacher. I'm going to be an actor. And so by the time I was a junior, I had declared my major. And at UC Santa Cruz, which was the newest of the UC campuses at that time, now we have Merced um, campus. But at that time, uh, we had no letter grades. We had narratives, only narratives. That was one of the things that attracted me, aside from the fact that it was in the Redwoods and I had met the first African-American professor there who came to Upward Bound and said, come down to Santa Cruz. I think that's gonna be the place for you to go to school. I will mentor you, come. And so that's really how it all began. And, you know, by the time I was a junior and had to declare, I did an independent major. I think they still have those, those there. And so I majored in black drama. And mm -hmm. so that was what happened in terms of my trajectory from Oroville 
Project Upward Bound, pre Upward Bound in that community, and where I was really guided by my elders. And then along that path, then it was UC Santa Cruz. And from there, I moved to the Bay Area and lived there for 17 years, got all my uh, union cards there, and then made the move to LA with the production that we had at the American Conservatory Theater where I taught and was in the company, Joe Turner's Come and Gone. So I was the first African-American to teach full time at the American Conservatory Theater. So that will go down in the annals. And at that period of time, I know that some of your uh, the, your colleagues and your classmates, uh, people like Danny Glover, Anna Devere Smith, um, you worked with Whoopi Goldberg in the very, very early years, was also Ted Lange was part of it there. Danny well. Glover. Yeah. Although, so, interestingly uh, enough, I didn't know Ted at the time. Interestingly um, enough, I did not meet Ted until I came to LA. And now we're very close. And he has supported the Los Angeles Women's Theater Festival for years as one of our co-hosts with Hattie Winston, who I just ran into the other night at the Mark Taper for the theater summer summit that they had there. Oh, yeah. that's cool. Um, yeah. So Ted, I actually met here. Awesome. So so in, in ACT and um, before you came to L.A., in between, you know, high school where you could play any role and be anything, and then in Santa Cruz, did, before you declared your black as a, a black drama major, were there opportunities in the college atmosphere to play roles that you wanted to play? Did you feel the same kind of freedom to do, you know, anyone in anything, or did you find yourself typecast once you kind of hit the real world at all? Well, you know, most colleges and universities. And that includes UC Santa Cruz. And I really had that underscored when I toured my one woman show and um, 40 states, three continents, now retired. I've done a lot. And I uh, don't feel that I have to prove anything to anyone at this point in time. Right. But what I discovered as I toured my one woman show, traveling around the country and even outside of the country is that the kinds of roles that are really in the United States at colleges and universities, the kind of roles that are oftentimes offered are not necessarily the leads. And oftentimes the productions are very Eurocentric. So that's one reason why you're not getting the leads. And that's one of the reasons why we created, again, something else I founded, Black Magic Theater, so that it spoke to us. And at that time, in the late 60s, we had writers that just, they were on fire. Ed Bullens and I mean, so many others. And Lorraine Hansberry, the list goes on. So that was what we did to make sure that our voices were heard, not only in, on campus, but in the community, because we also toured some of the shows that we actually created. And so when is it that you actually, so I, I hear that, you know, you thought you were going to be an English teacher. You probably, you were writing as a young child as well, but when did you get serious about the writing aspect of your own career, writing your own solo show? We'll get to the book later, but you know, in particular, your, your own solo show, what gave you that idea and who were your inspirations at that time when you created this show? Actually, at that time, I was still living in the Bay Area, and I was approached by Philip Walker, and he is the co-founder of the African American Drama Company in San Francisco. He approached me. I was at ACT teaching in the company, and he said, Adila, uh, we have an actor who's not going to be able to tour with us around the country with the solo show. Um, that we have for our, our companion piece, our woman uh, piece that we have, because he portrayed historical men, and this show was historical women. Can I speak for you, sister? So he said, I'd really like for you to do that solo show. And I said, a solo show? I said, Phil, I've never done a solo show. He said, oh, I think you can do it. I said, oh, Phil, I don't know. A solo show up on stage by myself? 
He said, yes, I think you can do that. I said, I don't know, Phil. I said, well, how much time do I have to rehearse? He said, you have seven days. I said, seven days? For seven characters, and how long is was the show? Like an hour? It was, about, it was a little less than an hour. Mm -hmm. I said, Phil, seven days? He said, yes. He said, so what we're going to do is we're going to rehearse 10 hours a day. Ooh. And then we are going to go ahead and get on the road. I said, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? So I got a space, a room, different rooms at uh, ACT, and we rehearsed. I mean, 10 hours a day, literally. We would stop for breaks, to eat, for meals, back on it. So when the time came for me to get on the road, he had said this, I think, in the beginning, for sure, by the time it was time to get on the road. He said, our first stop is going to be UC Santa Cruz. I said, UC Santa Cruz, <laughs> the first stop? He said, that's our first stop. I said, and oh. You know, you'd have some friends there and some audience. that. Oh, would but it was on. scary. <laughs> it was terrifying. I said, Phil, I went to school at UC Santa Cruz. I, I can't go there first. He said, well, that's our first stop. I said, oh my God. So in that audience, there was a student from my little town of Oroville who was a re-entry student. So we're talking about from my entire life, going back to childhood. There was Jill Alpers. Then we've got those who were professors when I was a student there. Staff who knew me. Students of mine from ACT that came down from San Francisco to see the show. All these people from all these junctures of my life were in the audience. And we had a pretty packed house. At one point I went up on my lines. I could not remember the next line to save my soul. Every, every actor's worst nightmare. Yes. <laughs> I don't know what I said in that moment. It felt like forever. And yet I know it wasn't. I know I was babbling. I know it didn't make any sense because it didn't make any sense to me. And then finally, I clung on to something that got me back to where I needed to be. After the show was over, I took my bow. I went into the dressing room. I was so embarrassed. I hear a knock on the door, it's Phil. I said, come in. I said, Phil, I'm sorry, I failed you. He said, you didn't fail me, Adila. He said, you had a standing ovation. You never saw it. I said, standing ovation. <laughs> so my first standing ovation doing his show, I never even saw it. And from there, we continued forward. And after that experience, I said, oh no, I will never allow that to happen again. So I know what I have to do. And one of the things that I have shared with other solo artists and that has guided me as a solo artist is realizing because you are on stage by yourself the entire time, it is important, it is vital that you go moment by moment. At the beginning of a show, you can't be thinking about your last scene or your last moment, your last beat. It has to be moment by moment, little chunks. And you have to hear yourself. You have to listen to yourself. You have to know what you're saying. You can't be on automatic. Every audience is different and deserves the best of Oh, I don't know if you hit a button. I'm having trouble hearing you. Did you hit it's it? Going moment by moment. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay. So, you know, I could go on and on and on, but I think that gives you a sense of how I have approached the work as a solo artist.
Yes. And and that was the show I am that I am woman black. No, that that was Phil's show. Okay, so and when did, for your yeah. sister. And when did you write your own show? Okay. So <laughs> follow me. Okay. So I moved to Los Angeles. I'm a storyteller at heart. I moved <laughs> to Los Angeles and um Either it was when I moved to LA or it might have been just before one of the shows I did with him across the country. But one night I went out by myself. Usually I was his open, his opener. And then he'd perform. This one particular time I went out alone and they gave me the check. They didn't seal the envelope. I opened up the envelope and I said, what? Phil is getting this much for me to perform? Oh, I got to create my own show. Ooh. So that was the impetus for me to create my own solo show. But not only that, I also, because I had moved to Los Angeles, so I was no longer in the Bay Area. And I really wanted to make sure that I was yet another who was keeping black history alive by the work that I was going to do. Mm -hmm. That was the bigger reason. Uh, that's a good uh, lead in. I wanted to quote something from your um, IMDb profile. You uh, say that um, you've been fortunate in landing roles that come close to who you really are, a woman of enormous strength, steadfastness and grit on a mission to teach us about life, history, and the rewards of perseverance. So segue into your solo show, I Am That I Am Woman Black, a historical journey into the lives of seven renowned women. You played Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Merrick McLeod, Beth, I, I, I'm- McLeod Bethune. Uh -huh. Zora Neale Hurston, Lorraine Hansberry, Angela Davis, and Maya Angelou. So how did you pick those seven women and what was your process and then going, okay, now I'm going to make my own show. I'm going to make my own money. Um, but I still say this is so early on in the development of the world of solo theater, who was doing solo shows in, in the world? Like wh who were your inspirations? Were, were there any yet that you had seen and like, okay, this is the standard for what a good solo show should be? No. There weren't just kind of making there it up because we're off. talking, we're talking now the late eighties. Okay. So they really weren't. And um, so what I did was I began to think of all the different women I wanted to portray. And there were many more than seven. I began to do my research. And then at one point I began to look over everything that I had accumulated about all these different women. And I wanted to make sure that I had a tapestry whereby the women represented different professions, different energies, different accomplishments. And so that's how I arrived at the seven finally that I came up with, different eras. And um, it was interesting because as I look back over my research, all that I had done, there were certain sections that I would reread and it was almost like the women were saying, you got to choose this section. You got to talk about this part of my life. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. You were like tapping yeah. in, being guided. Being guided. Hmm. And that's how it was. Whenever I performed, I would always, I had a ritual that I would do. And I would see myself in the center of a circle and all seven women would be circling me. Ooh, round and around. And I would ask them to embody me, to speak through me, to use me. And they always would. So if there ever were moments where in a second, I kind of, you know, lost where I was and it did happen again it wasn't just with Phil they'd always be there to catch me and so these women whose shoes I wore 
not only was I interpreting who they were, portraying who they were, but they were also inspiring me. Quite a group of women to be in the circle. Wow. And and they come from, you know, different places, different uh, time periods. Were you able, did you do a lot of research to be able to take on, you know, the truth of their, of their postures or their bodies or their, you know, their physicalities, their voices? Did you, I've never seen your show in all the years I've known you, but did you, you know, did, you have to have technique also. You can't just rely on you know, spirituality and, and being embodied, but you also are blending that with your with your skills and your techniques. So what was the kind of in-depth research that you did to really bring truth to these women? Of course, with those who lived and are living in my lifetime, it was easier because you could look at videos, you could hear their voices, you could look at their photos, you could see the interviews, so it was a little easier. However, with women that lived in other times, I would use whatever I heard in their words. 99% of the show is in the words of the women, not me. And with the early women during slavery, for example, I really studied their photos. I really listened to their speech and the writings that I've read. Mm. How did they speak? What was their language like? I really relied a lot on that. How did they dress? What clothing did they choose? How did they wear their hair? What kind of shoes did they wear? So a lot was really visual but it also had to do with their language in terms of hearing their voices through their own words. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of um, your colleague, Anna Devere Smith, who, you know, speaks about the musicality of language and when she embodies, you know, the, and I, I also do this when I embody the, the various characters, if it's based on a real person, listening to the music that is the way they speak. Um, That's the right. Tone, the intonations higher, lower pitch, uh, the cadences, the inflections up and down. So I can imagine, yeah, it's, it's a, that's a lot of work when, when you are playing real life characters and you can't just Absolutely. make it up. Yeah. And so 40 states, uh, three continents, you've been in Africa, Europe, the Caribbean, all, all across the country. When is the last time you performed that show and how many years have you been doing it now on and off? Well, you know, what's interesting, I had retired the show and for a few years. And then in 2020, just before the pandemic, a friend of mine approached me and she said, I want you to come. We're doing a Black History Month program and I want you to come and do your solo show. I said, Sylvia, I'm not doing the show anymore. She said, oh, but you got to come. I said, Sylvia, I'm not doing the show anymore. She said, oh, but you got to come. So she lives in this very hoity-toity uh, senior community. I think they have something like about 5,000 homes. It's like a town. Buildings and everything. They have everything except their own grocery store. It's in a place called Rio Vista. And I think it's called, I think the community is called something like uh, Trinity if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, I said, Sylvia, you're hounding me. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, I'll make a deal with you. I'll come. I said, however, I'm not going to do the entire show. I have not done the entire show for a while. And I don't know that I have the same stamina. My memory's not as sharp. I don't know that I really want to do that. I said, but what I will do is, if you want me to, I said, I'll come up, I'll do the opening poem, I will do the opening song, I will portray Sojourner Truth, I will portray Harriet Tubman, I will then break through the fourth wall and share with the audience 
that for the evening, they are going to learn a lot about me as an artist and about me as a person. And what they had just witnessed was me as an actor on stage. Then I segued from there and I said, now I'd like to share with you some clips from me in terms of my career on camera. So then we put my reel on. So they saw some of my work from TV and film. Then I segued from there and I said, I'd also like to share with you my work as an author. So then I read from my book. Then we did a Q and A. And then I met those who wanted a copy of the book in the lobby and I signed autographed copies of the book. It was wonderful. Now that I do again, I would do that again. I loved it. A great way of bringing back to life uh, an older piece, but reimagining it and then combining it with who you are now and where you're at now, or, well, you know, more now in your life. So, uh, yeah, speaking of your career in TV and film and entertainment in general, so you're an award-winning actor with over 50 years. You're uh, best known to television audiences for your role as Anne-Marie on the old TV show on ABC, Roseanne. You were in five seasons, uh, still running. In, it's still running. Uh, Turned out to be six seasons, actually, eventually. Six. Okay, you got to update your bio. <laughs> uh, and um, with the reboot with the reboot. Uh huh. And what I want to know is what what was so okay. And uh, you've been in Aaron Brockovich, tons of films. You've been opposite Hillary Swank, Sandra Bullock, uh, Julia Roberts, some really really big names, really big films, tons of TV shows, NCIS, Shameless. I saw you on that. I loved it. Harry's yeah. Law, Crime Set. You know, The Middle. Oh my gosh, there's just so many. Don't you, forget 4400. I was gonna say most recently 4400. A nice chunky role on that as well. And um, Mad About You, City of Angels, Family. All these Gilmore Girls. You have Roswell. You have like the the uh, TV and film actors' dream career. What was your big break in TV and film when you got here? And uh, and then I'll ask you the next question. But what was okay. the big break that led into TV and film for you? You know, that's so interesting. People say that all the time. What was somebody's break? Or somebody's break was when such something happened. And I really believe that everything we're doing is working toward that moment that I don't see necessarily as a big break but a moment where things are aligned and actualized in a way beyond what you've done before. So I would say it was probably Roseanne. And I would say it was Roseanne because, and this goes back to Phil's show, doing the one woman show with him. We were on the road and Oftentimes, if we had two shows and one was at the beginning of the week and one was at the end of the week, say on the East Coast, I would just stay on the East Coast instead of coming back to California. This one particular time, I said, Phil, I want to go home. I'll, I'll come back out, but I, I, I want to go back home. I didn't know why, but I came to understand why, because I came back to L.A., and as soon as I got back, my agent said, oh, I have an audition for you for a show for Roseanne. And I said, oh, that's why spirit was guiding me back this time. I said, OK. So ironically, the audition was on the same day that I had to fly back out. <laughs> oh, so I went in, I met with the casting director. And um, I said, I've got a plane to catch. And she said, I think you're really right for this role of Anne Marie. Can you hold on? Let me see if I can get all the producers, the writer, director. Let me, let me see if I can bring everybody together. I said, oh, okay. That was really the first time in my career where I felt so empowered that they were hustling to meet with me before I had to leave. And she gathered everybody together. So I went in, I read for them. 
And they said, we know you have a plane to catch. Thank you so much for coming in. I told my pleasure or whatever I said, I leave. Then the agent gets back with me and says, they've cast you in that role. I said, now I understand fully why I came home. So you felt so, it before the, you even knew the opportunity was there. Like you said, didn't even know. You so this, is, this is leading up to what you're calling the break. Okay. Because then I do the episode, it was called Bird is the Word. And the chemistry with Roseanne's character and my character was just so aligned. It was so connected. I said, wow, I can see this character coming back. I really like her. So the night that it aired, that was before we had cell phones. So I came home, turned on my answering machine. And the writer who created my character said, Adila, this is Don. I just want to let you know that we're watching you tonight. And we really loved your work. I said, oh, thank you. Or whatever I said. So I said, I've never had a writer call me before. This probably means they're going to have her back. So the next thing I know, they call back. Next thing I know, now they got me a husband, Jim Pickens. Now they got me a son. Now I've got a whole family. I'm like, oh my gosh. So something that was supposed to be one episode turned into ultimately six seasons. And the lesson in that is there's several lessons. One, always follow spirit, because if I hadn't come home, I never would have gotten that role. And I don't know that I ever would have been on Roseanne. Secondly, to just trust that if something is for you, it's going to be there for you. And that's what happened. And um, it, it was just an incredible opportunity. And they still play it. People call me all the time. Oh, I just saw you last night on Roseanne. The residual checks are still coming after all these many years. So it really has had a life of its own. That show for me. Wow. And it, 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 it's also um, called just listening to that inner voice that you don't always know why you're doing something. And you may just, you know, follow that, that, weird bizarre feeling and then boom the universe opens up and you're you kind of answered you know what one of my questions which is you know to to an array of starving actors or actors and actresses and especially now that we've been dealing with you know three and a half years of first pandemic and now this horrible strike how how do you know what your mindset has to be in order to achieve what you achieved in such an early part of the game um you know my, your advice for for people who are dealing with this and and wanting to have passion for their work i don't hear that you ever had like a day job or a side job or did you uh and i did and, i did okay, so when was the shift of like i am never going to do a side job anymore this is what i never happened do. it never happened that way uh -huh. But in my early years, when I was still in the Bay Area, I had a day job just like everybody else. I was a receptionist and I was a dog on Goodwood. And I really enjoyed it. And I would take my scripts with me and I'd rehearse with myself. I'd look at my lines, what have you. But I never missed a call. I enjoyed being a receptionist. But it came to a point where it felt like it was really time to consider not doing that. I didn't consciously say, okay, today is the day. But when Roseanne happened, things began, began to shift. And from Roseanne on, I never really had to have a day job again. I also worked at two hotels when I first got to Los Angeles and um, answering phones because that's what I did. I enjoyed it. I loved it. I love being the voice of businesses. And so basically once I accepted that role on Roseanne, the universe just kept supporting me. And so we're talking about going back to like 
90, 91. I haven't had a day job since. That's awesome. And I mean, yeah. I've worked in I've worked in theater. You know, I was uh, head of a program at Marla Gibbs' school, her acting school. I mean, I've done things in theater that I wanted to do, but not yeah. like a day job, day job. No, I haven't done that. And was it during that time period of Roseanne that you were able to, by the way, congratulations for, you know, the milestone of purchasing your own home, uh, something that every artist, you know, I would think strives for and, and thinks about. Was that when you were able to get your home? I got my home when I was doing my one woman show. Um, there were different uh, touring organizations that I was a part of that I would tour through colleges and universities. And one was called NACA, National Association of Campus Activities. And one year, the Southern region of the United States, <clears throat> I had 38 bookings. And I said, if I'm ever gonna buy a home, now is the time. And so this home, I can walk from room to room and say, this came from my one woman show. Oh, that's amazing. That's so inspiring. I mean, it was, we just think about, you know, the opportunities even now as solo artists. I mean, I've toured the country and I don't think I've ever, you know, really got paid anything you pay. We pay often to go somewhere, to go elsewhere and expose the audience, but that you actually created the mindset to, nope, I'm worth this. I'm going to get paid. I'm going to go here and here and here. It, it, that's very inspiring. I um, mean, you know, in the beginning, I didn't get paid much, yeah. Um uh, in the beginning with the show, I wrote a grant to the Department of Cultural Affairs, LA. And I thought, okay, if I'm gonna do this solo show, if I'm gonna be on my own, creating my own solo show, and I'm submitting for this grant, somebody told me about it like at the last minute and I got everything in just in time. And I got the grant and I had um, shared with them in the grant writing, my proposal was, that I wanted to present at senior citizen centers. Mm. So there were five of them. They all signed the letter, you know, their intent letter in case I got the grant, I got the grant. I chose them one because of my love for seniors as I talked about in my childhood, my elders. But I also felt if I'm gonna create a solo show, a new show, not Phil's show, but my show, then I want the audience that's gonna be least critical. And that would be seniors. <laughs> because they, they love everything. They just wanna be entertained, right? <laughs> and and you know, they, they, were just, they were just so inspirational and accepting. And one said, I'll never forget, she said, baby, she said, I think this is wonderful what you are bringing to us, but the young people need to see this too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, ma'am, you're right. Segue into the festival. So, oh my gosh. I mean, I can talk to you about your career for hours and hours. Um, I do want to mention, you know, you wrote a book in 2008, which was a bestseller um, on my own terms, One Actor's Journey. So for all of our participants and and friends, it's a great book. Um, I personally own a signed copy. and. Yay. That received and the others can get a copy too. They can go to my website and I'll be glad to autograph a copy. Exactly. I was going to say, um, you, you can get your book. Also, uh, I wanted to ask, how do we listen to your radio show? You did a radio show where you had a lot of uh, interviews and celebrity guests. Um, how do we, how do, is that still up on blakeradio.com? It's not, it's not no? but you know what? I think they may be able to see some of the, the archived uh, interviews that I did on blakeradio.com. If okay. it's still there in that format, they may be able to. And yes, uh, everybody that I interviewed was a celebrity and everybody I interviewed, I knew personally. So around. that's what made it really wonderful. And my first guest, I think, was Ella Joyce. And she said, you know, Adila, she said, I've been interviewed so many times. She said, but you ask questions that nobody ever asked before. Hmm. And they trusted me. And a friend of mine who is now passed, uh, Toby, Toby, I, she was, um, she was, I forgot what network, she, what station she was on. But I said to her that I was about to do this talk show. I said, is there any advice you'd give me? She said, yes. 
always make your guests look good. <laughs> so when I interviewed Marla Gibbs and Marla and I said, how did you come to move to LA? And she said, baby, honey, I was getting away from that husband. And I said, oh, let me go a different direction. <laughs> because I didn't really, I didn't want to go into that with her. That's funny. I got some advice from my wife, Ingrid, who said, you know, I, I said, oh, I'm going to go and interview Adila. And she said, OK, be Oprah. You are Oprah interviewing. Adila. <laughs> How do I be Oprah? Um, OK, Oprah. Beautiful. Uh, so let's. Uh, so you were talking about seniors and and the youth, and that's a, a great leeway into all the outreach and the work we do at the festival. And for again, for those of us who are brand new and, you know, kind of just found us. I love the story of how you met up with Miriam and the other co-founders and and decided to start this nonprofit. So tell us a little bit about the foundation of 31 years ago, almost 31 years ago. And you have a, you know, a budding career in film and TV, but you're still dedicated to theater and you create this nonprofit. Tell us about that. And very briefly, because we almost are at an hour, I could just go on and on. And I know. On. But um, just because again, I'm a storyteller, but I will say this, in 1993, there was a big conference that was put on by the California Arts Council. For those at that time, they had a touring roster. There were individual artists on there. There were also ensembles, theater companies that were part of the roster. So it was like getting the stamp of approval from the state of California, if you were in the roster, for those who were seeking artists and wanted to be assured that if they hired someone, they were gonna produce. And so that was um, that was the conference that they had that year. It was in uh, Pasadena. And so there were those who were on the roster and those trying to get on the roster. Miriam Reed was trying to get on the roster. So she came and she and I discovered we, we were kindred spirits because her women are Af her, her women are Anglo, minor African-American. And so that was our bond. And by the end of that evening or that weekend, they asked for announcements. So Miriam had the bright idea. It was really her idea, not mine. Miriam said, what if I go up to find out if there are any other solo artists here and how we can collectively support each other? I said, I think it's a great idea. She went up there to the mic when they opened up for comments and she identified me, I raised my hand all these women bombarded us at the back of the room, actors, dancers, storytellers. It was a huge conference. And we looked at each other and we like, we're onto something. And so two of them um, said, well, we're with the Burbank Little Theater. We can have the first meeting there. And that was the beginning. And we really took the reins from the National Women's Theater Festival that had come to Los Angeles the year before. And it was the Women's Theater Festival they were titled even before coming here, they were named. And so they came here, they didn't wanna come back. They said it was too schmoozy, too celebrity driven. So they wrapped their creative arms around us and guided us in the early years. And so we're very much indebted to the Women's Theater Festival that became the National Women's Theater Festival. And then did you ever think, you know, here we would be 30 years later? I never <laughs> thought that far ahead. I and, never thought that far ahead. And I can say as an organization, you know, being witness to it and being part of it, we've had so many ups and downs, but we've never given up hope and we've never stopped. And now here we are going into year 31, I think more, uh, more empowered than ever. Yes. Um, and we've gone through quite a few shifts in the last few years as as the industry has where we've been able to use zoom and um open up our audiences worldwide to be able to do performances and shows during pandemic and and now back to a kind of a hybrid form where some of it is live and some of it is in person but other we want to include the world like this um, and Facebook. And that's right. That's Facebook. right. So I hope that people who are in Los Angeles, because we are partly live again, finally, uh, will come to Empowerment uh, Weekend this weekend, um, tomorrow and on Sunday. And we have a number of workshops and panels. We hope that if you are local, that you will come. And if you're not and you know someone who is, 
please share with them what we're doing by going to our website at lawtf.org. Yep, absolutely. There's still time. You have a number of hours before we start tomorrow morning. So uh, there's time to sign up. And also if, um, if you know somebody who can make one day, but not the other, you know, have them come on down. And all in all, what we say about this coming weekend, you know, the next two days are going to be the most information that you uh, will ever find about what to do and how to do it in the production of solo performances at one time in one place. How many panelists and, and uh, moderators do we have? I believe we have something like about, let's see, how many programs do we have? We have one, we have eight programs. one two, three, four, eight. five, six, seven, I think eight. Eight, yeah. I think and important to mention, we're going to have a raffle over the weekend, and there are some amazing raffle One prizes. on Saturday, one on Sunday. And are you offering your your famous one week uh, writers retreat as part of yes, the? Yes, I am. Yes, and we I didn't am. mention and that, I but you... that, yes, I hope that those who are writers will come down to the Writers Well in Georgia and join us. We've had writers all the way from Ghana and Puerto Rico and throughout the United States. So I hope that those who either are writing or want to write have something new or something they want to dust off. Will come and join us. We would love to have any of you join us and all yes. of you join us. And so since uh, most of us, you know, know the schedule for the weekend, I don't have to go through, you know, all of all. No. Of but what I will say is, you know, it's going to be chock full of information about producing, about grants, about funding, about how to, how to hype press releases, social media. We have professional publicists, marketers, um, you know, everybody, uh, technical people, stage management, not just actors and writers, but everybody. It takes a team. Uh, it takes a dream team. I'll be um, moderating that tomorrow morning, mounting a show with your dream team. And throughout the weekend, you'll just be like completely empowered. Uh, if No matter what stage you are in your career, whether you're ready to take an old solo show and bring it on the road, or if you're just thinking about what are my ideas and my themes so I, I would love to open it up to some questions if anybody has um, from for just a couple of few minutes. We'll maybe go just a couple of minutes late if anybody wants to ask anything. So if you do have a question for me or for Ms. Adila, uh, just show yourself and ask and, and we'll wrap it up soon. But uh, anybody have anything they want to say or ask? And before yes, you I, do that, I just want to say that I was so focused on what we were talking about. My eye kind of noticed that there were chat comments. So yeah. forgive me, people. I don't, I haven't read them. So I hope that there's a way when we play this back that I'll be able to see all the different comments that I've noticed. Yeah, I think maybe, Mariella, you can do a copy of the transcript at the very end. So before you close out, we can, um, you know, she can. we can look at that too. I'd love to see that. Liza, you have your hand raised. Do you want to turn on your camera and microphone and uh, ask us something? Hi, Liza. Okay, it won't let me do my video, but y'all can hear we'll me. Yeah? Okay. You can. Where are you calling from, Liza? I am calling from Marina Del Rey. Cannot wait to attend the Empowerment Weekend tomorrow and Sunday. Oh, wonderful. Yes. So um, this weekend is perfect timing because I'm debuting in December and going on the road in 2024. And something I recently bumped up against that I'm very curious um, to hear from Adila and as well, Sky, you, you've done a tour as well, is the aspect of longevity. Um, I was uh, burning the candle at both ends, as they say, and recently just recovered from being um, a little under the weather. And I'm doing a musical. And so just how you keep yourself um, afloat and energized. And I know my friends in Edinburgh are doing like six shows a, a week. So if you could talk about that so I can really go into this tour prepared, um, that's like I'm bumping up against of that. So I'd, I'd love guidance about how you guys manage that. <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked that because that segues into our Sunday schedule oh, from 1.30 till 3.00. Myself and Christina Linhardt, we will be offering a workshop entitled Holistic Self-Care, blah, blah, blah. And so there we will talk about that. So I hope you will join us and we'll be much more specific about that in yeah. terms of how to really take care of yourself. 
Amazing. Yeah. And I'll just chime in. Um, longevity. I mean, I, I, I haven't been doing a show since the eighties. Um, uh, but I did work for seven years on my last one woman show calling America. Don't hang up. I started it at the San Francisco fringe festival and then it came to LA and then I went to New York to the United solo at theater row. And I almost had a nervous breakdown when I got to the phase of New York, because I felt like it was such a big shift and such a big thing and it's your baby you know you've been working on this and nurturing it and shaping it and molding it and making it grow like a baby and then you're gonna like you know hand it over to a director and show it to the world um but my my advice yes we will cover a lot of that tomorrow but um meditation yoga uh hot tub uh, massages and a lot of support from your friends and family and just like Adila said before, being in the moment, you know, just focusing on not what it's going to be or what you did before, but where are you right now today and using that emotion and that fear or whatever it is in the moment. Um, that's that's my short answer to that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, thank you. So, another, so thank you, Liza, and we'll see you there. Yes, yes, I can't wait to attend. Hey, introduce <laughs> yourself to me. Come up to me and let me know who you are. I will. I will, Adila. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else have any burning questions before the weekend? Anything for Ms. Adila? Any comments? Anyone? Anyone? Not sure. I mean, okay, just... I think we probably talked them all out. Yeah. And we're coming in right at about eight. So if there's nothing further that, in, oh, I see someone's, oh, someone says, thank you. Thank you, Paulina. Yeah. There's so if there's character. nothing further, I guess this is it. And so hopefully we will see all of you or many of you. Oh, here's another comment. Kat Kramer, looking forward to seeing all of you. Yes, Kat. And we're glad that you are going to be one of our presenters. And here's Heather Tyson. Wonderful conversation. Thank you for joining uh, us. Gail asks, what's the state or trend for solo shows these days? What's the state or trend for that? What do you mean? Is that a question you're asking me? That Well, Gail is asking. Oh, I didn't see the question. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and jana has got a comment. Now I'm starting to look at the comments. Well, there are the uh, comments, but the question. So is there a state or trend? You know, I think it's, uh, it, do, you know, do, do, do you, do you, you, do you. <laughs> Whatever your thing is, you develop yes. it, you try it. <laughs> I think that, you know, anything goes in terms of expressing your artistic voice. Just know that whatever you're creating needs to be at the core, educational, perhaps, but even more than that, it needs to be entertainment because people are coming to see you. They want to be entertained. They don't want to be preached to. They yeah. don't want to be talked at. They don't want someone getting up on stage and having an experience where they're working through something therapeutic. They want to come because they want to be entertained. Yeah. But Those when you can throw education in it as well, we call it edutainment. And edutainment. Uh, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's what I considered my work to be. Yes. Um, and right. and just, so it's a, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add to that, Gail. I think you know because we're a multicultural and multidisciplinary festival. There is no one right way to you know to do a solo show. I think you bring your skills, your talent, and everything you want to show off and shape it with you know what you can do versus what what are you trying to say? What is your message? and who is your audience. And we will definitely go into so much of that during the workshops and panels tomorrow. So. So again, we thank you. I see some familiar faces out there. I see our performer, Barbara Brownell. We love you. And I see JC, she's on our board of directors. I see Kat Kramer on the advisory board. I see Jonna Houston on the advisory board. I think that's Darlene Dunlow. It just says D, but I believe our journalist and the person who interviewed me just recently, most recently. Yeah. And um, see, I see Christina Linhart. She will be with me for our particular workshop. Vanessa Adams Harris, who has come again from Oklahoma to be with us and will be part of two of our workshops. 
And so thank you, thank you, thank you, those who have been a part of us and still are. Erica's joining us this year. Thank you, Erica Batdorf. And so we'll yeah, see. She's, she's Ada, coming Chang. Ada Chang is there. She's one of our presenters and has performed with us as well. So this is family. This Erica's is flying in from Canada. I think that's amazing that you're flying. Yes. Yes, she is, Erica. And also Ada's coming from Chicago. And Vanessa came from Oklahoma. So it's a national thing. Right on. So we start tomorrow morning at uh, 10 a.m. And uh, there will be lunch breaks both days. So you can either bring your lunch or walk around. You'll have an hour. What, an hour? A half an hour break? No, they have half an hour. So half bring an hour your break. lunch not a bad idea. Yes. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for taking time on this Friday night to join us and to hear this wonderful conversation. As we said, we could talk for hours and hours, but that's why we've got eight panels and workshops all weekend. Right. So <laughs> that's right. As always, well, thank Adila, you, and thank, thank you. you so much for interviewing me tonight and for being with the festival so many, many years as you have. And again and again, doing interviews and serving as a moderator, being on our panels. We thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that so much. Thank you. And thank you, Adila, for just being who you are. And you, we always say at our end of our board meetings, Adila is the one who keeps everything afloat. And you are, you're like the, the strong ship in the center of the ocean. And we all are, you know, the little boats surrounding, <laughs> surrounding you. Oh, what a nice image. <laughs> Thank you. I just came all up All right, that. team. So I guess that's it. And we'll see you in the morning. Thank you so Both much. Of you make it. Thank yep. you. And good night. Tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. I get to play my harmonica. Bye now. <laughs> Sayonara, signing off. Inspired. Signing off.